Um, this is an interesting topic. I'm talking about uh, Tibetan Buddhism beyond the Tibetan Plateau, and I'm talking about it in historical context, okay? And uh, uh, by the way, um, I'm going to try to speak more slowly because I do have a tendency to speak very quickly and a number of people have said to me, slow down. Um, so uh, I don't know, if I'm going too quick, can somebody in the back go, you know, give me a theatrical sign of some sort? Um, no, I'm, I'm semi-joking there, but uh, actually do let me know if I'm going uh, too, uh, too quick. Um, it's a really interesting topic um, and I think it kind of touches on what may or may not have brought some of you here, not this particular day, but uh, two things Tibetan uh, over the course of years. Why are non-Tibetans so interested in Tibet? Which, uh, by the way, uh, a number of Chinese leaders have asked this question as to why, you know, <laughs> why are people so interested in Tibet? Uh, why are they so concerned about Tibet? But uh, it's a reasonable question. Uh, nowadays we have all of these ideas, some of them come from post-colonial thought that uh, Westerners are interested in Tibet to use it as a, use it as a plaything for their own fantasies, etc., uh, etc. Et but the ideas about Tibet and about Tibetan mysticism and Tibetan, Buddhist, uh, Tibetan Buddhism being so otherworldly uh, have been around for a long time and they have been around before there were ideas, before there was Western colonialism, imperialism, and all of the sort of things that supposedly lie behind uh, uh, the modern day fantasy with Tibet, according to some people who follow a, a post-colonial script. Uh, some of you may be familiar with Marco Polo's uh, description of Tibetan Buddhists at the court of Kublai, Kublai Khan, where he talks about the tremendous miracles that they were able to perform, getting all sorts of bowls and cups filled with liquids to levitate and move to the Khan's place, um, they being able to control the weather. All of these things uh, are, are in Marco Polo and uh, if I may say so, Marco Polo makes it very clear that uh, there is no fraud <laughs> attached to any of this, that they really do these things. But, you know, this is an age of faith. Marco Polo is writing during an age of faith. So, of course, he says they indeed do these things, but they do so with the aid of uh, 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 demonic forces, not with the aid of the true God. Uh, so there is this idea about this. But you, you have all sorts of uh, interesting ideas about Tibetan Buddhism, ideas which, as I say, some people now try to associate with uh, the Western view of Tibet as uh, Shangri-La, um, you know, all, all sorts of other fantasies. The, uh, many of the motifs you'll find prior to that time. Um, there is an old Arab uh, uh, text, which is a description of the world. That's, I think it's 12th century, and it expresses the idea that in Tibet everybody's happy. You know, again, this is sort of a Shangri-La thing, but it's, you know, centuries, centuries ago. Uh, what I particularly like uh, is the description that uh, uh, within Tibet, smiling is general. Even the animals smile. <laughs> and, uh, uh, no, and, and this is what you find there. Again, you know, there's no colonial, post-colonial uh, agenda you know, in these uh, descriptions. So it goes back quite some time. But uh, the fact of the matter is that Tibetan Buddhism attracts interest from a very early uh, stage, not the period of the Tibetan Empire, but after the period of the Tibetan Empire, from a very early day, it attracts interest from beyond the plateau and from areas in which there are other forms of Buddhism as well. Somehow Tibetan Buddhism comes to really, really be seen as something special. Um, if you want, you could think about it in the context of uh, uh, the spread of Tibetan Buddhism well, in the United States and in the West. Uh, I sometimes uh, say to my students, and of course they're young enough not to really know this, but if I say, you know, go back to the 1960s and what Buddhist schools, what, 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 what form of Buddhism was the most prevalent among people who were not heritage Buddhists? That is, they, they were not born into families that uh, uh, came from Buddhist countries or were Buddhist practitioners. And when I tell them that it was Zen, or Chinese Chan, if you will, um, they're very perplexed. You know, they just think, well, of course, when they, 
when they come into my class, they have some ideas. Hopefully, when they leave, they've changed the ideas, but they'll come in thinking that the Dalai Lama is the Pope of all Buddhists all over the world, uh, things like that. Uh, but you look at it, uh, Tibetan Buddhism really now is uh, uh, the most prevalent uh, form of Buddhism that you find among uh, uh, people who are, as I say, non-heritage uh, 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 Buddhists in the West. Um, why is that? And I think we can go back, and here the historian goes back, we can go back much further in history. When I first began to study this, uh, one of the questions that I found really fascinating was uh, Buddhism amongst the Mongols, or rather Buddhism during the Mongol Empire, outside Tibet during the Mongol Empire. And the adoption of Tibetan Buddhism by the Mongols during this period, of course, is a, an event of world historical significance if I may uh, really be grandiose. Um, that's what I usually say when I uh, s uh, sort, sort of say to people, well, you know, you, you have to take my course, you know, uh, you'll, you'll learn things that you will never thought about, that you've never thought about. But it was an event of world historical significance, and I began to think, well, you know, why was that? And uh, back in the day when you would uh, look for explanations as to why Tibetan Buddhism spread beyond Tibet, and particularly why the Mongols adopted Tibetan Buddhism, um, you would find uh, the sort of ex sort, sorts of explanations that went something like this. Um, Tibetan Buddhism with its colorful, colorful tantric ceremonies and parades, and I, I, there's one person who actually wrote about parades, uh, um, reminded the Mongols of their sh shamanic traditions back in Mongolia. Now, you know, this is really, you know, reaching, you know, you're, and it's, uh, uh, you know, there's really no authority for that. I mean, it's very, very subjective. You know, not being a shaman myself, uh, I can't really uh, say whether I would be attracted to uh, uh, Tibetan Buddhist tantric parades. I, you know. um, the other thing which you get is that, well, Buddhism was a way to teach morality to uh, the Han subjects that Hubilai wanted a religion that would teach morality to his subjects. And you know, here you'll get a, you know, an idea of what, you know, what, I'm, what, I, what I'm like in class, um, I guess. Uh, uh, that to me is kind of like the Sunday school version of Buddhism. You know, uh, you know, rather sanitized and oh yes, yes, of course, it, you know, this is exactly what it was. Well, I began to scratch the surface, and I'm not the only one who did this, by the way. There are other people who have written about this. It gets to be uh, uh, very uh, uh, interesting, but I found that, or I began to realize that the Tibetan, the Mongol adoption of Tibetan Buddhism was very intimately connected to the spread of Tibetan Buddhism into the kingdom of the Tonguts. Now, when I put it like that, that sounds very mysterious. Arcane lore. And who are the Tonguts? Tonguts are an incredibly fascinating uh, uh, people. And what makes them uh, so doubly fascinating is that the, the state was destroyed by the Mongols. The Tonguts had their own script for writing. It was a character script, which was not Chinese, but it was a character script. And ultimately, knowledge of that writing system faded and faded and faded. And as a result, it became even more mysterious. And the Tonguts became this, this great mystery. And of course, historians are always you know, looking for mysteries. Nowadays, nowadays, there's been a revival of Tonguat studies. And there are a number of people who have worked on the Tonguat script and people who can read uh, uh, the Tonguat script, although their numbers are very small. Now, I have great respect for uh, uh, you know, people who have done that, but uh, a linguist friend of mine many years ago said to me, uh, you know, why don't we just uh, take all of the people who claim to know Tongut, give them copies of the same text, lock them in separate rooms, tell them to translate it, and then he said, I bet we don't get two matching translations. <laughs> now, um, I'm not that cynical. I am cynical, but uh, um, you know, I've seen a lot of things that have uh, uh, come from people who are working in Tonguat studies, but the, the uh, number of people who are in any way capable of dealing with these texts and the volume of the texts that we have, because a lot of ancient Tonguat texts have been found, renders this very difficult. So what we generally, what we generally go by, most people in Tonguat studies have gone by the Chinese records of the Tonguats from the Song Dynasty and then later on the few that you have relating to the Yuan and the Mongols. 
the Tonguts established a state in North China. They were a people who at one point were subject to the Tibetan Empire. In fact, the homeland of the Tonguts, the Tonguts speak a Tibeto-Burman language. And by that I mean they don't speak, or uh, excuse me, they, they spoke, or the Tongut language was Tibeto-Burman. And by that I mean it was not Tibetan, but it was related to Tibetan in the same way that English is a Germanic language. It is not German, but it is a Germanic language and it is related to German. The Tongut language is generally accepted by most people as having been a Tibeto-Burman language. But the script that they wrote it in, the Tonguts uh, created, the Tongut ruler created a script or had created a script that, as I said, was a character script, but different from Chinese. And so the decipherment really is problematic. Now, this is not the only state to do this. The Tonguts, uh, after the fall of the Tibetan Empire, uh, some of them established a state because they were uh, along the borders. Their uh, homeland was along the border. And indeed, um, some of you may or may not have actually, if you've gone to eastern Tibet, may have passed through an area that really was a Tongut area, Kam Minyak. The, uh, what we call Tongut in Tibetan is Minyak. The Chinese histo historians refer to them as Xixia, their state is the, or Xia, the, their state is the Xixia state. And uh, the Tonguts who formed this state formed it uh, in the area to the east of Amdo, to the east of the Kokonor, uh, east of the Xining area. And it was one of the dynasties during the uh, uh, period before the rise of the Mongols when you had uh, different groups, uh, Jurchen, Khitan, and the Tonguts establishing their own dynasties. You had the Sung in the south, and in the north you had the, uh, 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 the Jurchen with the Jin dynasty, the Khitan with the Liao dynasty, and the Tonguts with the Xia or Xixia dynasty. Now, something interesting happens with the Tonguts. All of these other groups are considered legitimate. They have their official histories as part of the record. There is a, a, an official dynastic history for the Jin, an official dynast dynastic history for the Liao, but guess what? There's no official dynastic history for the Tonguts. And that renders what we do even that much more difficult. You have to go looking in all sorts of places for records of the Tonguts. And the reason for that, and I'll, I'll be very brief about that, is that the Tonguts betrayed the Mongols. They betrayed the Mongols, and for that, the state was destroyed. Uh, some people talk about uh, the state being destroyed in such a way that, uh, you know, if you've seen uh, the stereotypical pictures of the Mongol conquest, you know, pyramids of skulls. Um, the records say that blood ran through the capital for, rivers of blood ran through the capital for weeks, uh, etc. Even the dogs and cats were killed. Uh, um, of course, this is, uh, um, how should I say, something of an exaggeration. We know that Tonguts survived. Many of them returned to what is today Kaminyak, which is one of the old areas that they had come from. And the Tonguts, who had established a relationship with Tibetan Buddhism, they brought Tibetan lamas to their court in the way that we had previously thought was something that began with the Mongols outside the uh, Tibetan plateau. But indeed, it was the Tonguts who brought Tibetan lamas to their court. And the Tonguts state retained a certain kind of cachet in Tibetan writing. The Tonguts kings were looked upon, the Tonguts em Tongut emperors were looked upon with a certain amount of, I mean, not, not the sort of a veneration accorded to the old Tibetan emperors, but nevertheless, they were considered uh, uh, enviable at least, or, or respectable. Um, at least uh, uh, most of them, and they find their way into Tibetan lore because the Tonguts return to Kham, and the lore and history of the Tonguts state and the Tonguts kingdom gets enmeshed with the lore and the history of those people who are Minyak in that area, Kham Minyak, and Minyak is just a synonym for Tongut. And so you find many of their stories become part of Tibetan history. But in addition to that, there are other sources which deal with the, with the history of the Tonguts state, or rather they deal with Tibetan history during the period of the Tonguts state, and so we get a lot of material from there. And so over the last few decades, 
people have been looking more and more at Tibetan sources, not just the Chinese sources, but the Tibetan sources for the Tonglas. And lo and behold, we find something very, very interesting. Um, the Tibetan involvement with the Tonguts comes from the fact that during this later spread of the Dharma, the early period of the later spread of the Dharma, say the 11th century, uh, the 11th century on, uh, when Tibetan Buddhism quote unquote revives, and I think as I said before, you know, the, uh, uh, the low point is because of the collapse of the empire, not because one uh, emperor for four years persecuted Buddhism in such a way that he was able to, to destroy everything. The uh, uh, economic collapse of the uh, Tibetan Empire left uh, Buddhism without the resources that it, en it had enjoyed previously, things that went not simply into monasteries and into support the support of monks, but for vast expensive projects such as trans the translation of Tibetan texts. Um, as Tibetan Buddhism revived, Tibetan Buddhism as I think I've also said before, is very distinct in that it experiences the transmission of, Tibetan, of Buddhism to Tibet is experienced in a very interesting way. It's not as happens with other countries, with some other countries, where you have a very brief but intense transmission of Buddhism, which then takes on a kind of national existence of its own. The Tibetans have a long period of coming and going to India, and of Indians coming to Tibet, and of Tibetans going to India. So there is a very intimate kind of transmission, which is why, uh, even if you're not specifically in Tibetan studies, if you're just doing Buddhist studies, the Tibetan language is tremendously important because of the wealth of texts that you have that were translated into uh, Tibetan because of this. And of course, the Tibetans receive texts that we would classify as Hinayana, as Mahayana, and most importantly, of course, uh, uh, Vajrayana, Tantric texts, things which are uh, developing in India. The Tibetan, uh, Tibetan Buddhists are basically bringing these things from India. And I say this simply to underline the fact as you know, or to undercut the opinion uh, that really is not prevalent today, but at one point was prevalent, uh, that uh, all of this uh, tantric, Vajrayana stuff is really not real Buddhism, but it's a product of this bastardization of pure Buddhism with Tibetan shamanism. Um, and there's that word again, shamanism. Uh, you know when you're talking about uh, uh, a pre-Buddhist religion or pre-Buddhist belief system and you don't really know what you're dealing with, just call it shamanism. That's, you know, that's the, uh, uh, um, how should I say, the all-purpose explanation. But what you really have now with this intense uh, and long-term transmission of Buddhism to Tibet at a time when Buddhism begins to decline in India, it really does start to leave Tibetan Buddhism and, it, and the reputation builds Tibetan Buddhism to be considered as that form of esoteric Buddhism par excellence. And of course what I mean here is Vajrayana and the use of Buddhism, Buddhist rituals, to further certain aspects, benefit for sentient being, through worldly means, let me put it that way things that you don't necessarily think of when you're just thinking of pure Buddhist theory, the sort of thing that you get in Buddhism 101. And this begins to draw the attention of rulers, of rulers. And the Tonggut state is a state in which you do have Buddhism. You have Chinese Buddhism, we know about that, that's uh, very prevalent there. But towards the end, the Tonggut state collapses in the 1220s. At the, towards the end of the 12th century, all of a sudden there's a great interest in Tibetan Buddhism. And why is there an interest in Tibetan Buddhism? Tibetan Buddhism, this interest, first of all, is at the royal level. And what is one interested in at the royal level? One is interested in power. And in the same way that religion does get intertwined with power in other societies, other continents, other centuries, the use of Tibetan Buddhism by rulers comes to be seen as something very efficacious. 
And you know, this is a formula which I've used you know, since uh, time immemorial, but basically uh, in that Tibetan uh, Buddhist practitioners are seen as uh, uh, practitioners of esoteric Buddhism par excellence. Tibetan Buddhism is seen as a very effective way to bring, and the, these, and the Tibetan Buddhist lamas are the ones, the mediums for this, the ones who can do this, to bring esoteric power into our mundane world and put it at the disposal of a worldly monarch. And we begin to see this first with the Tonguts, and then because of the Tonguts, who were destroyed by the Mongols, but nevertheless, these traces remain. And the interest in Tibetan Buddhism amongst the Mongols really starts in the area that had constituted the Tongut realms. And it is there that Mongols begin to take an interest in Tibetan Buddhism as a means to power. Now, when you start looking in Tibetan sources, you find some very, very interesting things. You find all of a sudden, you know, for instance, uh, the founder of the Digumpa subsect, his biography. His biography talks about letters from the Tongut emperor to him, to the Digumpa. But most importantly, we find that there's also contact between the Tonguts and the very first Karmapa. The very first Karmapa is invited to the Tongut court. Now, uh, when I talk about, you know, when I talk about this, I always have to, you know, be, you know because it's me, I always have to make it clear that I am, you know, I am not uh, trying to downplay spirituality in Buddhism. You know, when I talk about this, I'm just trying to say that things are very, very complex and all religions are multifaceted. Uh, to say that uh, uh, Buddhism could be seen as a way to bring power into this mundane world, esoteric power, is not to undercut any of the spiritual aspects of Buddhism. Um, the Buddhism of an emperor and the Buddhism of, a, of an ordinary uh, subject uh, are going to be qualitatively different. Uh, just as uh, you're going to have this different, uh, difference in, uh, uh, in, in many different realms. Uh, but you do have this idea about power. Now, when I say that, and I'll, I'll get to some of this uh, uh, um, later on, I, oh, I hope. Um, yeah, no, I will get to some of this later on. Um, uh, the exercise of this power, you have to understand, is enmeshed with Buddhist principles. Now, sometimes you'll say, you know, I'll say to my, uh, I'll say to my students in class, I'll say, what's the most, uh, you know, what's the most important uh, 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 principle of Mahayana Buddhism? Of Mahayana Buddhism, of uh, uh, the Buddhism of Tibet? And they'll almost all say nonviolence, that the most important principle of Buddhism is nonviolence. And then we talk about it, and, I'll, and I say, well, if, first of all, to say the most important is always uh, an off-putting uh, way of uh, putting these things, but prior to that, you know, one would have to say doing benefit for sentient beings, because this is Mahayana. You're, you're there to do benefit for sentient beings, and that benefit is very much connected to the Dharma. And therefore, the exercise of this power, the exercise of power is for the benefit of sentient beings. Again, doing benefit for the sentient beings is not ipso facto wholly identical with nonviolence, with Gandhian ahimsa. You know, it's very different things. So there are all sorts of injunctions here. Um, we find Dusum Kempa, the first Karmapa, declines to go to the Tongut court. And instead, he sends one of his disciples. And from there, we begin to see a very short, until the destruction of the dynasty, a very short lineage of Tibetan teachers at the Tongut court. And um, about 10 years ago, uh, in one text, I found something absolutely, absolutely fascinating. It was, an, it was a short biography of this Tibetan who was at the Tongut court, you know, within the historical context, he's well known, Dishi Repa. In fact, the, just his, his name, Dishi, is by itself interesting. It's a transcription of a Chinese term, uh, Di Shi, which means imperial preceptor. And so he already had this title at the Tongut court of being an imperial preceptor, something which people used to think for Tibetans this begins with the Mongols. But no, we can already, already see this with the Tongut court. And here's the interesting thing. 
He is there at the Tongut capital at the first Mongol siege. Now we know from Chinese sources what happened. The Tongut capital was the first really strong walled city that the Mongols encountered. And it's where they really had to figure out how to militarily, how to take a walled city. And they laid siege to it. And they began to uh, construct some engineering works to divert the river to flood the city. This is what they were going to do, flood the city. And the engineering works collapsed. Many Mongols uh, uh, drowned, actually. And they came to an arrangement with the Tonguts. They basically came to a treaty with the Tonguts, which obliged the Tonguts to aid the Mongols when uh, so requested, which they didn't do. And uh, when they were called upon to do it, they didn't do it. So when the Mongols finished what they were up to, they turned their entire, you know, the, uh, I'll be melodramatic, they turned their entire wrath <laughs> upon the Tonguts. Now, again, as I say, you know, there were Tonguts, there were Tonguts who actually surrendered. We find Tonguts uh, uh, in the uh, Yuan Shi, the official Yuan history, who were part of the bureaucracy. And we know that many of them managed to go back to the Tongut area in Tibet. But it's very interesting, this, this history of the siege with the waterworks, because there I am, I'm reading this biography of this Dishirepa, and lo and behold, the story of the Mongol siege of the Tongut capital is there in Tibetan, but it is slightly different. In the Tibetan version, in the Tibetan version, the Mongols <laughs> And, and by the way, the, the interesting thing about the Tibetan version is all of a sudden it switches into first person. It's not that Dishu Yurepa did this, all of a sudden it gets to be and I did and I did. Now, those of you familiar with uh, Tibetan historiographic writing know that there's a lot of copying. You know, and th you know, this is just part of the tradition and in fact sometimes we try to figure out the descent of the text, who got what from where on the basis of its construction because so much is copied. And we, you know, it, it, and, and this, it, there is nothing uh, um, unethical about this. This is part of the, uh, the tradition that you have here. And obviously, there were several texts that were being used by the author. And at one point, the author went to what, something we don't have anymore, but a first person account by Dishirepa talking about the Mongol siege of the Tongut capital. And what happened to. Uh, caused the Mongols to uh, give up on the siege and come to a tr uh, treaty agreement? Well, the Tibetans at the court did the propitiation of Mahakala, wrathful form of Avalokiteshvara. They did the propitiation of Mahakala and that, and this was seen all above the capital, all the signs were there, that brought the Mongol engineering works to destruction and the Mongols had to reach a treaty. Now, of course, later on, the Mongols do, des uh, do destroy the Tonguts, and uh, um, uh, I don't know if it's in this biography or if it's in another one of the accounts, but it basically says, of course, karma cannot be postponed indefinitely, <laughs> or words to that effect. So uh, ultimately, the, you know, the destruction of the Tongut state was going to happen in any, in any event. But it's very, very interesting. Um, looking at that, I then began to look at uh, uh, for other things that I could find, and I found uh, Maha I began to look at Mahakala texts, and particularly Kargyopa Mahakala texts. Now, all of what I've been talking about here relates to, in terms of sectarian delineation, the Kargyopa, one of the major Tibetan sects. You know, you have Kargyopa, Nyingma, Sakya, Gelupa. Um, you know, you don't have to take notes on this, you know, if, if you just, you know, just remember, uh, uh, remember, it's, this is conversational, you know, I'm not, I, I, know I, I may sound pompous, but uh, I'm really trying to be conversational about this. So, um, this really does relate to uh, uh, um, the, uh, the Kagyupa, and I began to look at Kagyupa texts relating to this wrathful form of Mahakala, and lo and behold, I find an earlier text associated with a figure named Sami Lotsawa. You don't have to remember the name, but this is an earlier figure. And the text is entitled, if I can remember the, uh, the translation, uh, the, uh, the way I translated it was, uh, um, how to usurp power. Uh, uh, or something along this, how to overthrow government. It, it's, it's something like that, through Mahakala. Anyway, um, it's a very short text. 
And, and as many of these texts are, in its construction, it's very, very concise. The first part gives you a story. The story is from India about a yogin who was practicing and just wanted to practice uh, the Dharma for the benefit of sentient beings, but there was a ruler who was oppressing the Dharma and tormenting sentient beings. And finally, the yogin, you know, uh, um, you know, without being too flip about it, it's sort of like an old Popeye cartoon, you know, where Popeye says, that's all I can stand, I can't stand no more. <laughs> and uh, he has to get rid of the ruler. And so you have this story, and he does so. For the benefit of sentient beings, without any self-interest. This is for the benefit of sentient beings. And then the second part of it gives you the formula, how to do it, which, um, is not easy uh, because there are certain things that you need um, and if I remember correctly these include uh, from the ruler that you want to get rid of it includes uh, semen, urine and uh, uh, diuretic feces and so these, these are, and, and then there are all sorts of other things which one needs to do so this is a how shall I say this is not something to be attempted lightly and not something that you th that you ought, that you uh, uh, could necessarily uh, do so um, ag again uh, the injunction at the very beginning of these instructions is that you must abandon all self interest all desire in other words you are there to usurp power with no desire for power. If you can think of some of the things that people say with regard to sexuality and Tantra, that is undertaken with no desire. You know, think about that. Now, um, I may have said this before, but uh, ultimately when these practices come to the Mongol court, could, could I really say that Kublai Khan, Hubalai, truly had no interest in power? He had no interest in power whatsoever. You know, I don't know, but nevertheless, nevertheless. So we have this tradition. We have this tradition, but uh, what happens, and this is very interesting, the Tanguts are destroyed. The Mongols are empowered, not just in the Tangut lands, but across much of Eurasia. This is a Mongol empire. A Mongol prince is established in the areas that had belonged to the Tonguts. His name is Kuden. And this is where Tibetan history, as we generally used to know it, begins on this question. Because Kuden uh, decides that he wants to find a Tibetan Lama. He wants to find a Tibetan teacher. And it is Kuden who then sends a uh, um, forays, military forays to Tibet to find a Lama. They are rejected by the Kargyupa sects whom they encounter, but ultimately they return uh, with word and then another expedition comes with the person himself of Sakya Pandita, one of the great scholars of the age. Sakya Pandita and his uh, two nephews, uh, uh, Pakpa and Chana Dorji. And uh, Pakpa, of course, eventually becomes the Lama to Hubalai. But what's interesting is that here you have the Mongol prince in the Tongut areas who decides that he wants to have Tibetans. Now, is this, you know, where does this come from? This is clearly connected to knowledge about the Tibetans in the area in which he is ruling. And let me, let me put, there are elliptical, um, how shall I say, elliptical references or proofs of this in things that we read because Tibetan sources, this is in Pawutsuk Lak Trengwa, uh, it's in the Deptar Marpo, the Red Annals has it, the Kebe Gaten, the Feast for the Learned, um, has this, uh, uh, this story as well. Namely that Gurden, this prince, was actually the incarnation of the last good Tangut emperor. The, the last Tangut emperor, of course, the one who, who gets destroyed, is, you know, it's just assumed, well, you know, he was bad, so this is his karma. But previous to that time in Tibetan sources, they were all, you know, you had these great Tangut emperors, and he is the incarnation of the last good Tangut emperor. Now, this does not come out of nowhere. This comes out of an awareness reading this. You will know then that the Tangut emperors were indeed patrons of Tibetan Buddhism. The Tangut emperors were devotees, they were practitioners, uh, they followed the teachings of lamas, etc., etc., etc. But, as I say, 
a lot of this has to do with power. And Goethe then becomes interested in this, and he invites them. And he ultimately winds up with Sakyapa. He ultimately winds up with Sakyapa. And the history of the Kargyupa with the Tongwoods doesn't just fade away. But it becomes, it's sort of wiped out later on. Not wiped out, it's ignored. It comes to be ignored for certain reasons, which I will get to. The Kargyupa, the Karma Kargyupa, in their histories, do not ignore it. You know, it's mentioned there. And as I say, we have sources, but you need to go looking for them. You need to dig them out, but it's there. You have this idea of power. And Guden is a supporter of Hubelai. And some of you may or may not know, but when Hublai takes the throne, it's very controversial. There's a civil war. Um, there was, I think about a year or two years ago, a, a, a tremendously idiotic Netflix serial on Marco Polo, uh, uh, <laughs> which uh, you know, I, I couldn't watch it after one episode. It was that bad. And, you know, and I'm, I'm the sort of person who can sit down in front of a television and watch almost anything. Uh, uh, but it was so bad. Anyway, at one point, uh, I believe Hubelai and Arik Bucha, his uh, rival, go mano a mano uh, on the battlefield, uh, um, which, you know, something which never happened, but the, the whole thing is absolutely silly. Hubelai, Hubelai needed support. He wanted, uh, well, he had the support of Kuden. Kuden, who was the one who had brought Tibetan Buddhists to his princely court, Hubelai wanted them. He wanted Sakya Pandita to come to his court. Now, by that, by that time, Sakya Pandita had passed away. So Pakpa, the nephew of Sakya Pandita, goes to the court of Hubilai. And there then transpires, it's very interesting, this uh, whole history of power, as it were, uh, and the use of Tibetan Buddhism as a means to power, which again, I have to say, this is not to uh, deny anything spiritual. I'm just talking about uh, 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 Tibetan Buddhism at an imperial court, at Tibetan Buddhism as practiced by an emperor. Um, Pakpa winds up going. And now, nowadays, when people, uh, were not, well, fortunately, we're, you know, we're, we're, we're undoing that, but for a long time when people talked about uh, the Mongol adoption of Buddhism, the Tongut precedent and the idea that the Tonguts had actually been able to wield Tibetan Buddhism as, if you will, an esoteric weapon, um, that sort of is forgotten and it tends to begin uh, with the Mongols and with the Sakyapa and with Pakpa and, uh, well, or Sakya uh, uh, Pandita. Now, this gets complicated and I don't want to go into this here because I, I really don't think it's, uh, it's terribly relevant, although you know, I could answer it in questions, but it gets complicated when uh, uh, Tibetans or more modern Tibetan writers simply d uh, describe the whole relationship as a priest-patron relationship in which the, uh, uh, the emperor provides protection and the lama provides spiritual guidance. When in point of fact, the, uh, the emperor and the lama worked together. They really worked together. The uh, Sakyapa had their own Mahakala traditions. And again, Mahakala is the fierce manifestation of Avalokiteshvara, protective, protective. And the great Sakya, uh, uh, um, uh, the great Sakya uh, uh, um, exponent of the Mahakala traditions was someone named Ga Anyan Tampa, or Tampa. He, he's, he, you can find a lot about him in the Chinese sources. And he is a great uh, uh, practitioner of these uh, traditions relating to Mahakala. And the interesting thing is that people used to, people used to say, oh, well, Tibetan sources, they're all, you know, the, the term was pious Lamaistic historiography. In other words, what you saw in a, uh, in a Tibetan book, well, you can't believe it. It's just, you know, these Lamas writing about, you know, miraculous things that I, but Chinese historiography, that was very sober and, uh, you know, clear headed. And uh, people had this kind of prejudice about uh, Tibetan sources versus Chinese sources. Now, indeed, all sorts of, all historical writing does come from a perspective. This is not to deny it, not to throw it out, but uh, Chinese historical writing traditionally has, has been seen as a guide to governance, if you will. The official standard histories are there to guide the emperor uh, of a g given dynasty. In fact, they're written to show the faults of previous uh, dynasties. And, of course, Tibetan histories are written to show the progress and the uh, uh, utility and the goodness of the Dharma. 
in human uh, life in human society. It, you know, each one has its own sort of prejudice in this sense, but lo and behold, we're looking at these sober Chinese histories, and we find that Ga Anyandapa, the great Sakya practitioner who figures in Chinese histories, by the way, you can also find him in the Persian history of uh, Rashid Adin, this is during, you know, who wrote during the period of the Mongol Empire. His world history mentions Bakpa and Ga Anyandapa as well. You find Ga Anyandampa uh, is performing certain rites which actually lead to victory for the Mongol troops as they go into the south to conquer the Song. And this is in Chinese historiography, that what he did, what he did, and you, you, there's, there are these, uh, um, you know, uh, Chinese language biographies of eminent monks, Gao Songzhuan. And if you look at the one for Ga Anyandampa, very interesting things you find there. In other words, what I'm saying is that this is a belief that was common. It's not a question of Tibetan historiography versus Chinese historiography. The efficacy of Buddhism in worldly affairs, which is what the emperor was after, is not really questioned. And we get a little hint of that when Marco Polo talks about the quote unquote miraculous and supernatural things that these lamas are able to do. It's very, very interesting. Now there's something also which is interesting which happens towards the uh, end of the, uh, oh, how much, how much, when did we start? I know, uh, oh, okay, so, uh, oh, okay, oh, okay, ooh, uh, okay, um, <laughs> Okay, back to speaking quickly again. Uh, um, okay, so uh, something very interesting happens towards the end of the Mongol period. Uh, the Mongols do have these imperial preceptors, Dishir. As I said, it's interesting to find that the title is actually there in the Tongut period, in the period of the Tonguts, from you know, uh, uh, from whence comes this Mongol tradition. This uh, uh, and you know, the wonderful thing about imagining the Tonguts and their place in this is that it's still a mystery. This is still something in which there is still so much to know, so much that re remains to be known. But the Tonguts are involved with the with the Kargyupa. And it seems that underlying all of this is a knowledge that actually the Kargyupa really do know and really are skilled at this propitiation of Mahakala. By the end of the Mongol, of the Yuan dynasty, all of a sudden the Kargyupa have become prominent once more. And we find invitations to the Karmapa again. And indeed, it is possible that one of the Karmapa was the, uh, I have a Tibetan, a modern Tibetan text, which says that the Karmapa actually received a, a, a Dishir title. And this is when, uh, at, a, at a time when we don't really know who the last uh, uh, Yuan Dynasty uh, imperial preceptor was. I mean, there, there's no real proof of this, but it's interesting that someone has this idea. Well, the, uh, um, the Mongols, of course, the Mongol dynasty falls. 1368, it's the end of the uh, Yuan dynasty. They're succeeded by the Ming, an ethnically Chinese dynasty. Uh, it's not a conquest dynasty. They overthrow the Mongols. Um, when the third Ming emperor, who originally rules in Nanjing, but then goes back to Beijing, when he comes to the throne, this third Ming emperor was, prior to becoming the, em the emperor, he was the prince of Yen, which is uh, the area of Beijing. You know, maybe you know the term Yenjing. Harvard has a Yenjing Institute, you know, one of the old names for Beijing. He was the Prince of Yen in Beijing. And he decides to invite the fifth Karmapa to his court. This is in the early 1400s. And he, the letter which he sends, we have. And he says, I first learned of your good name when I was in Yen, when I was in the north. In other words, already the Karmapa in the old Mongol capital of Beijing, the renown of the Karma Kagyupa had already begun to be restored. So especially uh, with regard to these, uh, 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 these empowerment traditions. So it, gets, it becomes very, very interesting that he is invited. And indeed, the Karmapa comes, and he's the very first of the high Tibetan uh, uh, lamas who comes. And the, the, uh, the Ming Dynasty bestows various titles on different lamas, and the first rank goes to the Karmaka Yupa. Sakyapa are also invited, but the Karmaka Yupa are really very, very important. And again, 
we have this uh, very interesting document in Chinese. The Ming Emperor had a scroll in five languages made up to record what happened during the Karmapa's visit. This was done at court. This is not you know, uh, a, a Tibetan gloss on things. It's not pi-Islamistic historiography. And the scroll, which has illustrations and then it's in, you know, it has writings in the five languages. I saw it a number of years ago at the uh, Tibet Museum in Lhasa. It was originally uh, kept at Tsurpu. Hugh Richardson wrote about it. He saw it at Tsurpu, the Karmapa, uh, uh, the, the chief monastery. Um, it's fascinating. It's full of miraculous things. This is done by court order. They're writing down all the miraculous things that happen. Visions in the sky, rainbows, rains of flowers, uh, sages being seen. Uh, all of these things are there and it happens during the time of the Karmapa's teaching. Now there's something else which we have in terms of this interest in Tibetan Buddhism. I started off this talk by saying, you know, maybe, you know, that maybe this relates to why some of you are here. Why are you interested in Tibetan Buddhism? It's interesting when you think about these things. Now, there's, there's something very interesting which we have. It's a document which is still extant. It's a letter from the Ming Emperor. This is Ming Chengzu, the Yongle Emperor, to the fifth Karmapa, in which he explains what happened when he did the practices the uh, visualization, the visionary meditation practices that the Karmapa had taught him. And he says, I was doing exactly what you told me to do. And by the way, it's a good letter. It's not a complaint. He's not saying, you know, saying something bad happened when I did it. He's saying, I was doing exactly what you told me to do. And I was sitting there. And I was able to visualize this Buddha right there doing the visionary practice and and the letter describes all of this describes the buddha and then it's and then it uh, uh the letter veers off uh, in a sort of meanwhile in another part of town or actually you should say meanwhile in another part of the world he then begins to describe the voyage of Zheng He, um who was a very famous uh, admiral of the ming in the early 15th century you know, this is, you know, Zheng He traveled, he, you know, his, his uh, um, well, if you've been reading the news about what's going on in the South China Sea, then, you know, uh, somewhere uh, the name Zheng He should pop up in explanations because uh, uh, many of the Chinese claims are based upon uh, voyages that Zheng He made. Now, he actually, he went as, he went as far as Sri Lanka and Africa. Uh, and uh, it's, this is one of the uh, uh, what ifs of history. What if the Ming in the early 1400s had not stopped and the, the Ming uh, the government just stopped you know foreign uh, voyages like that they just stopped it meanwhile from Portugal and Spain the Europeans are eventually making their way around Africa what if the Ming had not done this and uh, a Ming fleet had sailed into Lisbon you know uh, you know one wonders about these things but in any event Zheng He goes to Sri Lanka and he's, he, tell, he tells this in his letter. He says, well, you know, I was doing this meditation. Now, meanwhile, Zheng He is traveling and he goes to Sri Lanka. There is a, uh, a king there who's oppressing the Buddhists. And so with his uh, uh, forces, he eventually goes, he captures the king, and he captures the famous tooth relic of the Buddha. And he brings the tooth relic back to China. And then, the, you know, tying these two together, the emperor then says, he says, and I had, you know, the astrologers figure this out. The very minute, the very second that I had this vision, that the vision came to me, doing your practice, and I saw the Buddha, was the exact same moment the tooth relic came on board my boat, since it was a Ming boat. And then he describes, you know, how Nagas uh, trailed the boat as it went back to China, which, uh, by the way, uh, uh, um, uh, um, a scientist said to me, uh, someone who was involved with whales, uh, said, uh, uh, you know, the waters around Sri Lanka actually are very rich in whales, uh, some of the richest in the world. So, you know, I don't know. I'm not going to say that, oh, they, these are whales. I'm just saying what you have there in the, in, in the letter. But clearly, Tibetan Buddhism is seen as efficacious, efficacious to accomplish otherworldly things. Now, this is at the beginning of the, uh, 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 the Ming Dynasty. And as I say, you know, you have this introduction during the time of the Tonguts, then it's adopted by the Mongols, then you have the Ming, and then you have what is perhaps the uh, most unusual uh, uh, instance of this, and this is during the reign of Ming Wuzong, 
um, in the early 16th century, for Ming Wuzong was an emperor who, like others before him, was devoted to Tibetan Buddhism. Now, um, you cannot say about China that, oh yes, it was a Tibetan Buddhist country. There, or, you can't even say that the Ming was Tibetan Buddhist. There are reigns. And it's, it's sort of like the Tang period too. The Tang is considered a very Buddhist period, but there are some reigns which are in which Buddhism flourishes. There are reigns in which Buddhism is uh, uh, suppressed. Um, this is not something universal during the Ming period, but Ming Wuzong, the early 16th century, he likes Tibetan Buddhism. Oh, not only that, it comes to him. He realizes that he is an incarnation of the seventh Karmapa. Now, at the time in Tibet, there is an eighth Karmapa. But Ming Wuzong, who is doing all of these Buddhist practices, he, adopt, he takes up a Tibetan name, he wears Tibetan robes, he decides that he, and, and by the way, the, after, after he passes away, the historians at court make sure to get, you know, <laughs> how shall I say, uh, 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 to denigrate him. Uh, um, he was considered uh, a, a, terrible, a terrible ruler and all of this, but he's very devoted to Tibetan Buddhism. He sends a mission. Since he's an emanation of the seventh Karmapa, and there's another emanation of the seventh Karmapa in Tibet, the two should get together. <laughs> and so he sends a mission uh, uh, to Tibet, which is a disastrous mission, led by a eunuch named uh, Liu Yun, if I remember correctly. And the mission, uh, 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 does, you know, not only does it not find the uh, uh, Karmapa, the Karmapa's entourage does not, does not want anything to do with the mission. And uh, uh, they wind up eventually getting robbed and beaten and, you know, they eventually make their way back. Um, I think they make it back after, the, after uh, Ming Wuzong has passed away at which time good Confucians are once more in control of things and the whole thing is seen as an embarrassment. And not only that, uh, uh, Wu Zong is actually removed from uh, uh, um, the lineage of those who are supposed to get uh, certain rights, which uh, uh, the emperor's descend uh, descendants perform, ancestral rights. He's taken away because he's considered to be completely debauched. Uh, oh, and by the way, uh, yes, of course, as with Tibetan, you know, uh, very often happens with Tibetan Buddhism outside Tibet, um, the element of debauched sexuality attaches to him. Of course, you know, he must have had debauched, you know, the whole thing must have been debauched, just as uh, at the beginning of the Ming period, not during the third Ming emperor's uh, uh, time, but earlier when the Mongols fell, the story circulated that, uh, oh yes, uh, uh, the Tibetans were basically taking advantage of, the, of Mongol credulity and uh, simple-mindedness to, uh, uh, to use the Mongol women in the palace for their own uh, nefarious uh, 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 pleasures. Um, one does find this uh, uh, happening, uh, uh, you know, here and there. So, in any event, uh, uh, we wind up with, ooh, uh, okay, so that's, that's, the, that's the Ming, but uh, uh, let me just uh, uh, wrap it up by saying this continues, this continues, um, uh, in fact, you know, there are all sorts of ways in which one, one could see little strains of this. So, so that, for instance, um, uh, among the people who uh, uh, go to the Ming court, not just the fifth Karmapa, but others go as well, uh, Tsongkhapa is invited to the Ming court. And he says, no, I'm not going. And, uh, uh, you know, it's a famous story. There's nothing in Chinese records about the invitation because you don't put into the official history somebody saying no to the emperor. Um, so uh, his disciple, Jamchen uh, Chuje, uh, Shakya uh, Yishi, you know, the founder of Sera, the one who established Sera, he is sent in his place. So the Chinese records have Jamchen uh, Chuje just showing up, you know, uh, almost uninvited, but, you know, he it just says he came to court. Um, later on, he's invited on his own, but uh, the Tibetan sources actually have the whole thing. They even have the invitation letter. You can find the invitation letter to Tsongkhapa uh, uh, and Tsongkhapa's uh, polite refusal uh, 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 in these sources. But then Jamchen Yeshi, very interestingly, uh, now this is Gelukpa, and we find how this thing sort of, you know, you know uh, uh, moves. Jamchen uh, 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 Chuje, Shakya Yeshi, um, comes to be seen as an emanation, Im incarnation, if you will, of Pakpa, of Trigil Pakpa, the Sakyapa. 
And later on, the Changkya Lamas during the Qing Dynasty, uh, some people call them the Beijing Lamas or the Peking Lamas. They're the ones who were resident in Beijing. Uh, they are seen as incarnations in that lineage as well. This, this comes much later, but the idea is that there is an incarnation lineage that is based in Beijing, which is Sakya and then becomes Gelugpa. And it's, it's very interesting because, the, of course, the Gelugpa historiographical tradition becomes the dominant historio histor historiographical tradition. And particularly in the middle of the 17th century, when the fifth Dalai Lama with Gu Shri Khan basically puts an end to the power of the kings of Tsang and their Karmapa Lamas, and the fifth Dalai Lama writes his own short but very important and very influential history of Tibet. That whole Karmapa, Kagyupa, Tango thing, non-mentioned, unmentioned. And the interesting thing about it is that uh, this is followed. Sumpa Kempo writes, in, in people for people writing large global histories, the Karma Kagyupa have their own tradition, but in terms of the large global histories, entire histories of Tibet, the fifth Dalai Lama, Sumpa Kempo, they don't mention this antecedent. It's as if it all begins with the Sakyapa and the Mongols, then Tsongkhapa's disciple is an incarnation of Pagpa, and then of course you have the Changkya Lamas who are in that lineage too, but the whole business of what happened, the fact that the Mongols were so influenced by the Tongut tradition, all of that is gone, and because it's from the fifth Dalai Lama and Sumpa Kempo, well, lo and behold, this, you know, at the dawn of, uh, well, not the dawn, I, I should say, because this begins with, uh, well, maybe, yeah, uh, Kurishi Choma, but at the dawn of Western Tibetology, these are the sources people are looking at. And they're adopting this view, which, in a sense, takes the real origins of this tradition of Tibetan Buddhism outside the plateau at Chinese courts, and they just cut out the real beginning. And so when you read Giuseppe Tucci or you Richardson, you know, and these, these are good scholars, but they're working in, you know, with a certain Tibetan tradition, and they don't realize, you know, all of the things that uh, went before. But you do wind up with this tradition continuing. In many ways, you could say the high point is the 18th century for the Qing, when the Qianlong Emperor is ruling China for most of the century, most of the 18th century, and he is a devout Tibetan Buddhist. And of course, he is somebody who uh, does not hesitate to deploy power. Um, the same thing with uh, the fifth Dalai Lama. Uh, I'm, I'm embroiled in a little controversy about this because of something I translated from the fifth Dalai Lama, in which he actually does, he's, he's urging on military action in very uh, blunt terms and you know some some friends of mine it's a, it's a friendly uh, ar uh, argument or dis uh, discussion really not an argument you know are saying well you know it's hard to believe that the fifth Dalai Lama would do such a thing but uh, again um, you know I ha you know I, I would say well first of all the fifth Dalai Lama was a state builder he was building a state and a state exercises a monopoly on violence and decides when this needs to be used. But um, the Qianlong Emperor also fielded armies, you know, in battle. And he was, in fact, he was, he, uh, as many of you may know, the Qianlong Emperor is regarded as a manifestation of Manjushri. And indeed, the idea that the Chinese rulers, just as you have Avalokiteshvara in Tibet, so you have Manjushri in China. His field of activity is China. And so this is an emanation of Mandrashri. Uh, in fact, I, uh, I, I'll, I'll, um, you know, there's a lot more that I could say, but you know, you know, since I'm depriving you people of momos, I mean, I, you know, I, I don't want to keep you keep you here too long. But this whole idea—it's very interesting. Um, uh, Chiang Kai-shek, uh, during the uh, Republican period, tries to reestablish some sort of relations with Tibet, and at one point, the 13th Dalai Lama writes that if uh, um, if he is willing to establish a priest-patron relationship, then there's something to talk about. Now, the priest-patron relationship would require Chiang Kai-shek, of course, to be a Buddhist. And as everybody knows, he was, I believe, a Methodist, uh, uh, and a very ostentatious meth uh, Methodist at that. So finally, one, one final thing, you know, um, the Qing dynasty 
the Qing dynasty in many ways was undermined. It's real downfall. It's sort of like what happened with the United States in the Vietnam War. You know, that whole era of post-war prosperity really came to an end with Vietnam, with the United States pouring resources into an unwinnable war. Uh, it, you know, it really changed uh, 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 the situation. Uh, something similar happens during the Qing in the 18th century, that in, they get embroiled in a war in Yarong or Jinchuan in Chinese. And part of that war is made against uh, uh, a kingdom that is Pimpo. And so there's a very interesting commentary. I forget where, where it's from, but I remember reading it saying that, uh, 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 you know, because they, you know, there, there's always been this argument among Tibetans that, you know, so much of Pen practice seems to be Buddhist, that maybe it is a kind of Buddhism and this is not something that has been argued in modern times, but Tibetans themselves, you know, or, or, you know, in the 20th century, Tibetans themselves have argued about this. And there was somebody writing, and I forget, oh, gee, I wish I, 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 I could remember where it was, but it was something to the effect that, well, this proves that, uh, that Pern has nothing to do with Buddhism. For Manjushri would never send soldiers to attack Buddhists. Uh, so, there you have it. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop here. Uh, I hope you got something out of it or some, some idea about uh, Tibetan Buddhism beyond the Tibetan Plateau. But um, if you have questions, if you're still awake, um, you know, I'm willing to answer them, okay? If you have a question, I'm going to give you the mic. Thank you. Um, had China not gone into Tibet in the middle of last century, would any of us be here now? Would you have a teaching career about Tibetan history? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sorry I opened the, uh, uh, the door to, you know, counterfactual history. Um, that, you know, there's, uh, I have no idea. All I can say is it did go into Tibet and, uh, and this happened. Um, I have some Tibetan friends who get really annoyed when Westerners say things like, well, it's really too bad what happened to Tibet, but you know, the Dharma wouldn't have come to us otherwise. Um, you know, because you know, he basically felt that, you know, what the Tibetans had to suffer, you know, uh, is something that's not for your benefit uh, or the benefit of, of, of Westerners. Um, you know, for the, you know, by the same token, you could ask, uh, you know, if the Guomindang had finished off uh, Yan'an, where the communists had retreated to, would any of this had happened? If, uh, if Kerensky had managed to suppress the Bolsheviks, would any of this have happened? I mean, it's, you know, the what-ifs become, you know, uh, 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 very, in, you know, you know uh, how should I say, very entangling. So, um, I don't know. If you ask would I have had a career, um, I would assume that I would, I would have been interested in Tibet, but uh, you know, m my interest in Tibet was peaked uh, you know, when I first traveled overland to India and I began coming into contact with Tibetans in India. So I guess you know, maybe I wouldn't have, but maybe I would have and I would have just gone to Darjeeling and instead of you know, Dharamsala, I would have been in Darjeeling in Kalimpong. Uh, uh, meeting Tibetans who are not refugees, or I, you know, I don't know. I mean, you know, this what if is uh, it's fascinating, but in the end, you know, you know, there's, there's not much I could say. It, it's interesting to think about, but you know, I don't think you can come to any sort of uh, hard conclusion about what the world would have been like. Can you can you talk a little bit about the King Ashoka in India and how related to Tibet? How does King, how does Ashoka relate to Tibet? Well, Ashoka provides the uh, uh, ideal of a Chakravartin, you know, a wheel-turning monarch, and you do have this uh, ideal there, that uh, there is somebody, and again, somebody, a, a ruler, who exercises power, and this is what we see. You, one could say this is a model here, uh, who exercises power for the benefit of sentient beings which is understood as to further the Dharma, which brings benefit and peace to sentient beings. So, you know, that model is there, the idea of Chakravartin, and, uh, uh, I mean, Ashoka is, you know, is the ultimate Chakravartin in many ways, 
And that term, Chakravartin, appears uh, in Tibetan accounts of some of the uh, Chinese rulers. The third Ming emperor is referred to as a Bala Chakravartin, you know, and, uh, uh, and of course what one understands by this is that he has received initiation. And I didn't get into the initiation empowerments, which is a very potent term when you think about it. He, he has received these empowerments and uh, he is referred to, in fact, I think he refers to himself as a Bala Chakravartin in a letter to the Sakyapa or maybe, maybe the letter to Tsongkhapa, I don't know. Uh, Qianlong, the great Qing emperor, was absolutely considered a Chakravartin. Korlo uh, Gyapo. Uh, the Bala Chakravartin is Topki Korlo uh, Gyorwe Gyapo. Um, and in Qianlong's tomb, which, uh, and which is very interesting because you know, the, uh, Qianlong's tomb is never meant to be opened and uh, subjected to uh, scholarly analysis. It was very private and as people have noted, this is where you really see what he believed. Because this is not uh, anything that is meant for other people to see. And you have all sorts of things in Lanza's script very clearly Buddhist, and right above where the body was, on the ceiling, is a wheel of the Dharma, symbolizing that he was a Chakravartin. So in that sense, exercising power for the benefit of sentient beings. Um, the Ashoka model is, uh, um, it, it's a very interesting one. Uh, one of the Jigungpa hierarchs who exercised secular power amongst the uh, amongst the, uh, 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 Oh, I, I, amongst the the family that uh, from which the Kura, uh, 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 the family, uh, uh, ruling family of the Trigongpa, is an interesting story. He is actually exercising secular power. He has to go into battle, and after a battle, he looks at all the bodies on the battlefield and he becomes disgusted with that. And it's very, very Ashoka-like. Although if you want to be, uh, you know, stretched a bit, you could say uh, Milarepa's revulsion after he exercises his power at the <coughs> destruction he's done is also very much in the line of Ashoka, although, it was, you know, this is not dealing with uh, 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 secular power. But uh, anyway, uh, yeah, the, the idea, it, it, it's not so much Ashoka, it's what Ashoka symbolizes as uh, Chakravartin. I think that's uh, uh, important. Yeah. Thank you again for another really interesting session. Um, at the very beginning, you raised the question of the fascination of Westerners with Tibetan Buddhism. And it sounded like you were saying that you know, there was more of a fascination with Tibetan Buddhism than perhaps with other Buddhist sects. And I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about that, why you think that might be, um, you know, and that it's Tibetan Buddhism that seems to be the form of Buddhism that may be more prominent or that may be attracting more Westerners than other, other forms of Buddhism? You know, it, it, it's, it's really hard for me to say, and I would not totally discount some of the superficialities that people pick up when they look at Tibetan Buddhism, the idea of the Dalai Lama. Um, I mean, you know, again, I'm not, you know, I, I, I don't really have an answer for you, but why does Madame Blavatsky with the Theosophists uh, decide that there is a Himalayan Brotherhood, <laughs> the Himalayas, and you know, the Dalai Lama in the Himalayas. You know, you can travel to Dharamsala and then write back that uh, I saw the Dalai Lama in the Himalayas. I mean, why, you know, uh, what is it about this? And again, this is a very superficial uh, uh, aspect to it, but part of it I really do think is that this aura about Tibetan Buddhism and Tibetan Buddhists really does spread from, you know, f beyond the plateau into these dynasties and states that are established on uh, Chinese territory. The, uh, the face of Tibetan Buddhism, which is really esoteric, and once something is esoteric, you have the idea there's much more to it than, say, you know, another form of Buddhism, which is, seems to be r rather straightforward and on the surface, that, you know, uh, Alexandra David Neal, why did she call her, and this is early 20th century, you know, uh, um, uh, Magic and Mystery in Tibet, I think, was one of the titles. I mean, mystery, you know, magic, you know, you'll always get that. But the, uh, um, uh, the Buddhist presence in Beijing 
I think was also very Im important in this, that Westerners coming to Beijing in the 19th century, in the late 19th century, really, d you know, they, they would see Chinese Buddhists, but the Tibetan Buddhists, who already had a reputation uh, among the rulers of several dynasties for being, you know, the masters par excellence of esoteric Buddhism, I think this would have attracted people as well. And again, Marco Polo. Just open up Marco Polo, and uh, it is the Tibetan Buddhists in Marco Polo who are the mo you know, he's not talking about Chinese Buddhists, he's talking about Tibetan Buddhists there. So I think it has something to do with it. Um, you know, I, I really don't know, you know, the, the beat literature, Gary Snyder, Jack Kerouac, you know, is very much uh, filled with things about uh, Zen. Certainly, uh, uh, in the Dharma bombs, you know, it's, uh, it's really about Zen. And then, you know, at the end, Allen Ginsberg is a devotee of Chogyam Trungpa. I remember, you know, it came back to me years later, listening to uh, and seeing Hair when it was originally on Broadway. And there's one song where in the background, there's the chant, Om Mani Padme Om. And it was only years later that I realized, oh my God, that's what there's, you know. So, kind of that, that aura of it, it just, but it... Mm, I mean, it, actually, actually, I find that, in, that, that interesting. I, I, well, actually, that... The mantra Omani Pemiham appears in the Dharma Bums, which is written, I think, in late no, late fifties. And, it, and, yeah. it, and I remember, you know, hearing this chant, and then years and years later, this was way, you know, way before I was interested in any of this stuff, and thinking, wow, that's what they're saying, and you know, kind of like the connection. But it's it's definitely in the background in one of the songs. Here. That is interesting. That's very interesting. I I think I may have mentioned this uh, uh, earlier, but uh, this. This business about omen, uh, I mean, it, it, just to give you an idea about how, you know, things from five centuries ago actually connect with what we have here. Um, there was a lot of skepticism about Tibetan Buddhism at the court of the third Ming Emperor. This is the early 15th century. Uh, he invites the fifth Karmapa. And there's an unofficial history. There are two unofficial histories in which I found this story. They're Chinese histories. They're not official court dynastic histories, in which there's a little account about, uh, uh, in fact, it's in unofficial histories where you later find out about Wu Zong and his proclivities of dressing as a Tibetan and all of that. But in these other ones, they talk about the fifth Karmapa coming to court. And this is not in that big miracle scroll, but they say that he is teaching six syllables to the emperor. And then they uh, sort of give this own money premium in Chinese transcription. And the person who's writing it, of course, is a good Confucian. And the Confucians and the bureaucrats clearly disliked this whole thing. They certainly disliked it with, with Ming Wuzong. And so he writes that uh, uh, um, uh, he gives his own uh, um, uh, translation of it. He writes it in different characters so that it reads in Chinese. It translates as. Uh, ah, I gotcha. Um, you know, I gotcha. And then he says, I asked several people, and they said it's not even a Buddhist term. Oh, money, pay me home. So, and this is in the early, early uh, 15th century. So uh, it, it's funny how fascination with things like that, these little things, uh, uh, pop up in many of the same things. You know, I realize I really haven't answered your question as to you know why, but uh, I don't, I don't know. But it seems to be a persistent thing. So Chogun Trungpa was very charismatic, and Alan was interested in the in the music and the, the poetry of that tradition. But it also and they just not just human beings in positions of power using Tibetan Buddhism, but the spiritual teachings using human beings. Yeah, I certainly don't want you know I I, I, I certainly don't want to give the impression that uh, uh, I was downplaying the spirituality of it. No, um, I mean absolutely so not. Both ways. But yeah, it's not just one way. Yeah, I don't know, but, uh, I, you know, it, it, it's one of these things where then I would say, well, you know, um, why didn't Gary Snyder, you know, basically uh, uh, go over to Tibetan Buddhism or something? Uh, you know, I mean, he was very much yeah, taken with Zen. I don't, you know, he I... He went there, though. He lived yeah. there. He had a relationship. Yeah. And Alan had a relationship with Chogun. Yeah, in yeah. Like you went to India, and I went to India in that Tibetan month. Yeah, and, uh, you know, here we are. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thanks, Professor. And about uh, Munya, is it uh, like a uh, Tibetan language or in translation by the Tango terms? Um, that 
was one of their own ethnonyms, uh, Minyak. And, and, you know, it's something which we find also in Chinese transcription. You know, Muya, uh, 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 I think the Mingzhang Tusu, um, you know, the Ming also is part of that. But it was, one of, it was their own ethnonym, uh, which the Tibetans use, Minyak. Um, so, I, you know, that, it comes from the Tonga language itself. Just a, a comment or observation on Tonga's geography. I found the maps in a new history of the Silk Road quite useful. Mm -hmm. That's how I'm re recommending the book for its maps. So I'm not finished reading it yet. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Professor Stolin. I have a quick, uh, I have a quick question about yeah. Tangut because uh, during the Qing Dynasty. Uh, the Manchu and Mo in the Manchu and Mongolian languages, they both use the Tangu to refer to Tibet instead of yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm interesting. Is this also related to the Mongolian uh, cosmology, which may take the Tangu as a part of Tibetan tra Buddhist Buddhist tradition? Um, you know, this is a really interesting question, and I, I generally would tend to uh, think that the relationship between the Tibetans and the Tonguts being what it was, um, that you would have this. There's a, uh, um, the, well, the, the, in Manchu, the word Tongut refers to Tibetans. And in uh, Amdo, amongst the Mongols in Amdo, the Khoshot, they would use the term Tongut to refer to their Tibetan neighbors. Uh, they would also be Tongut. Um, um, this I may have, you know, again, I, I think I may have mentioned this uh, uh, in a previous talk, but there's a really interesting uh, um, uh, error in Yeshki's dictionary. Yeshki's dictionary, which was completed, the English version was in 1881, and it remained for a long time the primary uh, Tibetan English dictionary of classical Tibetan that we of the old school would go to. Um, um, you know, I don't know if any of you are aware of this, but dictionaries actually used to be in books, and you would open them, and you would actually have to know the alphabet to find the term. Um, in uh, Yeshki's uh, dictionary, he quotes the Gerap Sewe Melong, and uh, it, he quotes it to the effect that, and then the royal power passed from the emperors to the Tonguts meaning from the Tibetans to the Tonguts. And actually, in the original Gyarup Sewe Meilong, it says to China, because of the fall of the empire in certain areas. But for some reason or other, he wrote the Tonguts. And I said, this is incredible, because it really makes the Tibetans sort of like, uh, or the Tonguts, heirs of the Tibetan empire. And uh, of course, it's a misprint. I went through the Gerab Sewe Meilong. I went through several versions of the Gerab Sewe Meilong, hoping that maybe there's one version, but it, it's not there. And uh, uh, Per Sorensen, who's worked extensively on the Gerab Sewe Meilong, uh, never came up with uh, anything like that either. But there's something really interesting, though, about this. The Tongut emperors, I, I mentioned that uh, Guden, the Mongol prince, was considered to be an incarnation of the last good Tongut emperor. There's a certain cachet, a certain amount of honor that accrued to the idea of Tongut emperorship, so much so that uh, when you find um, uh, you know, certain Tibetan uh, um, principalities or kings arise on the plateau, particularly around the time of the Mongols, for instance, the king of Chune, uh, um, you, know, you know, the various Gyalpo that you have in different places. Um, many of them try and establish a link to the Tibetan royal lineage. So that the, uh, the, the Chune Gyalpo, um, his descendant comes from uh, a branch of the Tibetan royal lineage, not from the emperor's Songsen Gampo on down, but from an earlier offshoot from that line. But then you have some places in which they claim to be descended from the Tonguts. You know, not from the Tibetan royal uh, uh, imperial line, but from the Tonguts. And that, that just makes this all so fascinating. This is a, you know, this is a, uh, 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 a lineage that was destroyed. That was destroyed, ignominiously defeated, but their reputation amongst the Tibetans, you know, again, as Dharma Rajas, 
that's you know it's quite tremendous. There's one of the uh, origin uh, um, accounts of the rulers of Sikkim has them descended from the Tongut emperors. Uh, Chang Latu in Song, they're descended according to their own accounts from the Tongut uh, uh, royal line. It's uh, it's quite interesting.